Well, it's Christmas time, and when I was a kid, in order to find out what kind of present we have, we'd have to kind of crack open the wrapping paper, we'd have to shake it a little, weigh it out, see what it might be, but nowadays you can just go to your mom and dad's Amazon history and you probably get a good indication of what's coming your way this Christmas time. From family, that is. Maybe from Santa, you might have different gifts. Do me a favor, try this one out. Try asking Alexa if reindeer can fly and see what happens. <laughs> Christmas is always a fun time of year. Maybe you've reached your breaking point of Christmas songs. You're tired of hearing Mariah Carey and you're tired of hearing Michael Buble, so you've settled in for some Gwen Stefani and some Blake Shelton. You know, you make me feel like Christmas. You mean tired, broke, exhausted, stressed? I don't know what they're trying to get at when they sing that song, but one thing's for sure, Christmas brings a lot of struggles, it brings a lot of stress, and it brings about an opportunity for us to evaluate those struggles and the stresses for what's really important. Christmas should bring things into alignment. When we talk about gifts, we should focus in on the greatest gift that has ever been given to us, and it should lead us to praise. It should lead us to rejoice. It should lead us to exalt the name of God, because the greatest gift that was ever given was the gift of Jesus. That's why at this time of year, we choose the day of December 24th to prepare ourselves for the birth of Jesus Christ on the 25th. We prepare ourselves for that arrival of Christ. We prepare ourselves to celebrate God's gift to us. In the Old Testament, before Christ was born, the prophet Zephaniah had this to say in the scriptures. He says in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20, Sing for joy, daughter of Zion, shout loudly, Israel, be glad and celebrate with your heart daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is among you. You need no longer to fear harm, because on that day it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals, and they will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yes, at that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. And at that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at that time, I will gather you, and I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. The Lord has spoken. Much like we spoke of last week in the book of Jeremiah, we see here in the book of Zephaniah a, a similar context of dealing with the exile and God's plan to restore his people back to himself. Uh, these words speak of a prophetic message of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, to be born, to come, and the one who can restore Israel. These words deal with, yes, a, a physical returning back to Israel out of exile, but they also deal with a returning spiritually for the people back to God, for the sins of mankind to be forgiven. These verses are being spoken of, they're being proclaimed by the Lord and they speak a message of hope. And during this stressful and difficult time of life and year, we need to be focused on that message of hope. We need to be focused on the advent of hope, the arrival of hope that we see in Jesus Christ. This book 
has to deal with really a triumphal entry of our King Jesus that would be born a babe and live a sinless life and grow to become a man who continued living a sinless life as to be the perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Zephaniah tells us that because of that message, that message of hope in Christ, that it should lead us to rejoicing. Yes, the Lord sings over us because he knows what he has in store for us, and we should result in exaltation of God for that. We should rejoice, and we should turn our attention to the Lord Jesus during this holiday season. As with Yom Kippur, the city had to be cleansed for which God could dwell with his people in their place. And that was difficult because in the city lived sinners. And so God had an ultimate plan set aside for Jesus to bring cleansing to the hearts of mankind. And the New Testament, in particular, the book of Matthew chapter 1, we see that God had a plan to come down and be with us, to bridge the gap between us and God so that we could have a relationship with him and be totally cleansed from our sins and their consequences. Zephaniah the prophet, after pronouncing judgment concerning exile, gives a message of hope. And we too, when we look at our sin, we see that it will be judged. But those who know Jesus, those who have met him, they have met his forgiveness and have received his salvation. That should be a message of hope. In Matthew chapter 1, it gives us this picture of the hope that Zephaniah spoke of that would lead us to rejoice, that would lead us to exalt God. It was pointed out by Pastor Carl this week to us that exalt, that this picture is a jumping up, a leaping up of excitement. And he thought of it invoking the prodigal son returning home and the father jumping up and running after him. What, what a great picture that we should have in our minds as we study Matthew chapter 1 today and look at how God wants to be with us. Matthew's explanation of the birth of Jesus is not as detailed as Luke's is. It is right to the point. And in Matthew's explanation, something that needs to be considered is the cultural context of the day and age. That must be understood as we read this story of the birth of Christ and its interactions with Joseph and the angel. Because in those days, to be betrothed, to be engaged, to be married, came with a different set of circumstances than we have today. Just think like homeschool courtship, okay? It's a lot different than maybe some of the dating shows we see, like The Bachelor and Bachelorette on television today. Like polar opposites, right? Today's understanding of marriage was far different culturally than that day and age. In that day and age, a, a husband-to-be often would times would go to a, a village or a neighboring village, and he would offer a, a goblet of, of wine, a, a drink extending from that goblet of wine as an invitation to marriage. And if the bride were to receive it, she would take a drink from that cup, acknowledging that she wanted to be betrothed to be married to her husband. This has pictures of communion. This has pictures of a future tense of, of, of Jesus, what he wants to do with us by having communion with us, because the now groom-to-be would go home, and he would go back to his father's house, and he would prepare a place for his bride. It was during that time of the, the betrothal that they were considered to be married, that they were considered to be united. They would not live together or sleep together, but they were, for all intents and purposes in the eyes of the culture, seen as married. Later on, that bridegroom who had gone to prepare a place for his bride would return to retrieve his bride to take her home. This evokes images of us 
the bride of Christ, the church, where our bridegroom, Jesus, has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us with his Father and that he'll return for us one day. The seriousness of an engagement like this was held to high accountability. The book of Deuteronomy ex- describes it this way and explains it this way, that if the betrothal time were to be violated, if that were to be broken by sexual immorality, that in fact, the cause uh, would lead to an effect of stoning. I mean, it was held in such high regard. Marriage was held in such high honor in that day and age, and it was to be treated that way. And so as we come to the picture that Matthew paints for us of the birth of Jesus, we're going to see Joseph kind of caught off guard by his bride-to-be, Mary, being pregnant by the Holy Spirit and carrying the Son of God. Now, he had every right to divorce her for that act. He had every right to even put her away, to be stoned in the Jewish law, but we're going to see how God intervenes. What a great story it is. Look with me in Matthew chapter 1, starting out in verse 18. It says, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, publicly decided to to divorce her in secret. Now, we see that Joseph genuinely loved Mary. And the word of her being pregnant led him to a conclusion. He thought to himself, well, I know surely I haven't violated this betrothal. I have not violated this covenant that I'm entering into between God and Mary. I have not done anything wrong here. I must have been taken advantage of. I imagine maybe the the sorrow of let down expectations. This is a young man. They got married in, in, uh, at young ages during this day. And, and the excitement that he must have had to become a man and to start a family. And it seems as if all of that came shattering down in just a moment's notice with a word coming to him that she was pregnant. Maybe you've been in a situation before where just a word coming to you has really let you down. All expectations that you held high and so dearly have clearly been unmet. And you feel let down. Maybe you feel let down by a person. You even feel let down by God. And in your mind, you start to spin and you think about what it is you're going to do. What it is that you are going to do. For Joseph, he intended in his mind, he set in his heart to divorce her quietly. This is a man who loved her and cared for her and just thought it would be easier just to just break this covenant and and divorce her quietly before we are officially married. I'm not going to expose her publicly. This scandal, it will bring shame to me. It will bring shame to her. So he decides in his heart to divorce her. What is it that you've decided in your heart to do that's outside of God's plan? Maybe you've intended in your heart to do something. You've made a decision and you haven't consulted the Lord. You haven't sought the Lord. You haven't heard from the Lord, but you're going to do it anyway. Maybe it's taking a job. It's moving. Uh, Maybe it's some scenario where you're separating yourself from a certain friend group and attaching yourself to someone else. You might have a, a laundry list of ideas and things that you've intended in your heart to do without consulting God on, and you haven't heard from God. It's a great piece of advice that I've heard in my life is if you haven't heard from God, wait on God. Don't make a move until God tells you to make a move. See, he intended in his heart to divorce her, and maybe you've decided in your heart to do something. Maybe your expectations were let down, and so you're going to turn to self-medication. You're going to turn to another 
person in this world to fill you up. You're going to turn to a decision to maybe cheat on your taxes or sidestep something to try and get away with something you intend in your heart without consulting God. But the story of Jesus' birth has a but God moment until the Lord reveals himself to Joseph through an angel in a dream. Let's continue on with the story. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 25 says, But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I love the words that are spoken here. Don't be afraid to do what God wants you to do. Don't be afraid. Fear keeps us from following through. Fear keeps us from living faithfully. Don't be afraid, Joseph, for the child that is in Mary's womb has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is a miraculous gift of God. Verse 21 says, she will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The ESV study Bible Bible says this, Justin pointed this out. Pastor Justin from Anchor South said, the name Jesus was given to sons as a symbolic hope for the Lord's anticipated sending of salvation through a Messiah who would purify his people and save them from oppression. Well, a message of hope. See, in that day and age, those people, they would name their children, they would name their sons Jesus in hope of Christos, the Messiah, the anointed Savior. They would name their child Christos in hopes that Jesus Christ, they would name him Jesus in hopes that that Messiah would come. And the naming of Jesus from God, the angel to Joseph, saying his name will be Jesus, saying this is the one who fulfills the hope, the one you've waited on. This is the Messiah, the Savior, the anointed Savior of the world. And verse 21 says, because he will save the people from their sins. Now, all of this took place in verse 22 to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. Ah, what peace it is to know that Jesus, Emmanuel, the name of God, is a name that declares he is with us. Emmanuel, which translates, God is with us. So when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel commanded him. He married her, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. While Mary, this young woman in the Hebrew Palma, it would be used to describe her as a young woman in the Greek The word that is used is parthenos. It's a word to describe a young woman who is a virgin. Mary, miraculous Mary, chosen by God to conceive by the Holy Spirit a child and give birth to Jesus to carry that child. What a miracle. It was all done to pronounce that God wants to be with us. He is coming to be with us. He's taking on the form of a man so that he can be the right, true, and just, perfect sacrifice to save the world from their sins. Mary's miraculous conception, it fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy, and it declared that God wants to be with us. Not God is against us, God is angry with us. God hates us. God is opposing us. No, God is with us. He is for us. He cares about us. 
No, he's not against us. He doesn't hate us. He longs to be with us. The phrase Emmanuel, God with us, sends out a bigger message than just, yeah, he's hanging out. Oh, it's a message of hope. This God, who because of our sins has broken the relationship, our sins of intentional and unintentional actions, thumbing our nose at God, spitting at God, defying God, rebelling against God, severing the relationship that he longs to have with us. God's saying, I want to mend that. I want to be with you. I want to forgive you. Think in your life where you have wronged someone, you've offended them, you've hurt them, you've sinned against them, and they accept your apology. They embrace you with a warm hug and peace rests upon the relationship. That is what God does for us. When he came to be with us, he came to bring us peace and to restore the relationship. So if this is true, and if we believe that God created the heavens and the earth, that he sent his son Jesus through the miraculous conception of the Holy Spirit inside of Mary, and that he died for our sins and rose from the grave and ascended to heaven, and he miraculously has sent his presence to us, giving us that peace in the form of his Holy Spirit. If we believe that to be true, we ought to follow the example of Joseph. Today, I want us to think about what it is that Joseph intended to do in his heart. He intended to do in his heart what many of us intend to do. Maybe even for the most part, we've got maybe good intentions, but we still want to do it our way. But our way is not God's way, and our way is not humility. Our way does not fear the Lord. Our way is actually wrapped up in pride and defiance against God, whether there's good intentions or not, because our way declares that God's way is not better. Our way seems to be what we think we need and want for ourselves. But when Joseph heard from God, and as you've heard from the word of God today, when, when we hear from God, we've got a choice what we want to do with it. God allows us to either accept it and follow him and obey him or to reject him. The combination of the words listen and obey in the Old Testament Hebrew, that language for obey and listen, it was this idea of a combined act. Yet you listen and you follow through. You listen and obey. So this Christmas season, when we think about Jesus who would be born and he would come to this earth and that it would cause us among all of human history to see it and exalt and rejoice and, and to lift high the name of God and magnify him and, and to be filled with excitement over the greatest gift of all time. When we think about that moment, it should lead us, yes, to rejoice, but also to obey. When Joseph heard from God, Joseph then obeyed God. Joseph stepped in. He took on insults from the community. He took on the shame. He took on the role of being a father of Jesus. And so now Jesus has been given that royal lineage from the genealogy of Joseph. And he obeyed. Just think about if Joseph had intended in his heart to disobey and to step outside of God's will and to do things his own way instead of God's. Think about how different it could have been for Joseph. God, he will accomplish his will with or without us. And oftentimes when we're in defiance against God, God still uses our defiance to accomplish his will. Just think about Pharaoh. God raised him up for this very purpose that he might 
display his power among the nations through him. God really doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us and to invite us into his plan. So if you've been tempted recently to intend in your heart to do something outside of God's will without hearing from God, the message today is God is with you. He has brought peace between you and the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. And if we believe the message of the miraculous birth of Jesus and the Christ story, and we've entrusted our lives, and we've entrusted our hope of salvation in Him, then we should follow in Joseph's example. And instead of intending to do in our own heart what we want to do, we just humbly say, God, okay, I'm listening. I want to hear from you, and I want to follow through with what you want me to do. You know what it is. The Holy Spirit has been hitting you this whole sermon with what it is He wants you to do. So Right when we get done, when we pray, you just immediately obey. Step into it and say, God, all that I am, all that I hope to be, it is yours. What I can't do apart from you, I am now asking for you to do in and through me. I'm tempted to go my own way, but I want to obey and follow you. Would you empower me to do so? That's a great prayer, friends. It's a prayer we ought to pray this holiday season as we think about the birth of Jesus Christ and his arrival. We cannot wait to celebrate Christmas Eve with you and the 26th, the day after Christmas. We will have our Christmas Eve services listed at anchorchurch.com, and you can find us at our locations on the 26th at our normal times. God bless you, and Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining us today.